This week we travel to the Horn of Africa for a closer look at the investment opportunities and challenges in the East African nation of Ethiopia. Officially known as the Federal Republic of Ethiopia, Ethiopia is a landlocked country situated in the Horn of Africa. With close to 82 million inhabitants, this East African nation is regarded as the second most populous country in Sub-Saharan Africa and also the most populous landlocked nation in the world. Its capital city of Addis Ababa serves as headquarters for both the African Union and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. It also recently played host to the 22nd World Economic Forum on Africa. Despite being celebrated as Africa's oldest independent country, Ethiopia has faced a lot of hardships throughout its history. The country has suffered periodic droughts and famines that led to a long civil conflict in the 20th century and a border war with Eritrea. Conflict was rife in late 2009. Ethiopia is one of Africa's poorest states with almost two-thirds of its people illiterate. However, it is regarded as one of the fastest growing non-oil economies in Africa, with Ethiopia said to be one of the top 10 fastest growing economies in the world by 2012. Uh, national ownership and leadership and African leadership of its own development, Ethiopia is unique in terms of never having been colonized, it was occupied only for a few years, and therefore in terms of its perspective and views, again, a unique contribution to provide. From an economic point of view, Ethiopia is estimated by the IMF and by the Eco Economist Intelligence Unit to be one of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world in the next five years. Indeed, according to some estimates, it will be number three after only uh, China and India in terms of global growth, we we'll expect a growth of over 8%. The economy is primarily based on agriculture which contributes 41% to GDP and more than 75% of exports and employs 80% of the population. The major agricultural export is coffee, providing approximately 30.6% of Ethiopia's foreign exchange earnings in 2010 to 2011. Other traditional major agricultural exports are finished leather goods, pulses and oil seeds. The current government has embarked on a cautious program of economic reform, including privatisation of state enterprises and rationalisation of government regulation. The government is implementing its ambitious growth and transformation plan, which aims to achieve an average growth rate of 11.2% and meet all Millennium Development Goals. The plan is, is, is ambitious, but it is feasible, it is possible to achieve it, and, and, and therefore the thing now is not to um, nitpick about this in that particular aspect of the plan. Uh, the thing to do now uh, is to build on it and, and, and push uh, the uh, issue of the implementation of the plan as far and as fast as we possibly can. Joining me now in studio to give us their views on Ethiopia as an investment destination, Martin Davis, he's CEO of Frontier Advisory, and John Gachura, Head of Corporate Banking at Barclays Africa. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Well, looking at the Ethiopian growth, growth and transformation plan, do you believe that 11% growth target is very, well, is achievable? Perhaps that's the terminology. Well, Bronwyn, we saw The Economist magazine a few weeks ago stating that perhaps growth will be somewhat subdued. But, you know, as mentioned, a few of us, John included, we were up at the, the up there for World Economic Forum a few weeks ago. And the official figures, word on the street has it, are perhaps understated. So perhaps already Ethiopia is in double-digit growth and 11% may not be as, uh, as un unrealizable as perhaps uh, many would initially assume. John, agriculture is obviously a huge part of Ethiopia's story going forward and perhaps the, the Ethiopia Commodity Exchange has really transformed that landscape so farmers can now share in 70% of the final export price when it comes to commodities rather than the 40% they had prior to the commodity exchange being established. Absolutely. So the, the Ethiopian Commodities Exchange is, is, is a perfect example of what can happen when farmers have full information. What the commodity exchange in Ethiopia has done basically is to transform the old system where farmers would sell produce through local cooperatives. And these cooperatives would aggregate and eventually do the export. And the farmer really only knows what the gate price is. What commodities exchange has done in Ethiopia is to give full transparency 
to that price chain uh, before the commodity is exported. And a lot of countries are looking to that model. Uh, when we visited Ethiopia during the World Economic Forum, quite a few governments, or government officials, actually went to see what happens in the commodity exchange. I know Kenya has been trying to put something together. I know there is one Africa-wide that is trying to be put together in Botswana. I know that uh, Nigeria is interested in putting something together that's very much akin to the commodity exchange model in Ethiopia. Were you impressed by the commodity exchange model, Martin? Mm. I think what is wrong, just speaking generally, is that supposedly Africa has 80, 85 million smallholder subsistence farming type, um, type farmers or far, uh, farming families, perhaps. The imperative, if we are, we, and the figure we often hear is between 40 to 60 percent of the world's arable land remains in Africa. If we are truly to, to tap into and leverage this potential, we have to marketize our uh, resource sectors around agribusiness. There's no better example than, than, than Ethiopia, as mentioned in the introduction, 40% odd contribution to GDP. I think the commodities exchange goes some way, perhaps even learning lessons around India, getting small farmers into a market, access to information, know what the sort of the market value, the sales value, and what, what the income will be, from that, from that trade effectively. The marketization of small agricultural, small holdings um, on the continent, it's an imperative. Extensive opportunity and again, as we heard in the introduction, plus 80 million people, so above that number and growing. But we've got inflation sitting at around 32% in this country. Yes. It's a big barrier basically to continued growth of this nature. Absolutely. Look, um, I, I think what that tells you is that the real growth is probably unfortunately negative. But that said, uh, one has to remember that Ethiopia is coming from a low base, first of all, so 11% is an achievable number. Two is that inflation is a very controllable number. Growth is a lot harder to push. Inflation is a lot easier to control. And I think looking at what the government is doing, if you look at the the things that the government did between 2008 and now 2012 in terms of their financial sector, making sure that they come with rules about their monetary policy and changing it to, to basically control inflation, it is very fathomable that that, number of in, that inflation number will come down very quickly. What's a lot harder to control is the growth number. Do you believe that inflation is going to come down quickly? No, the government, I think it will. I think it, it won't come down to sort of single digits any time, you know, very soon, but it'll start to, to be more subdued, and that's a very positive. I think the, the main driver we see this, I think there's some parallels here, you know, looking at, um, I know the Ethiopian government, for example, has been taking a lot of advice from, from the Chinese government, having similar experiences back in the mid to late 80s of very high growth, very high inflation, which ultimately, as John alludes to, hits the, the, the poorest the hardest. So from a social stability perspective, from a political, uh, political stability perspective, it's, it's important that the, I think, the, you know, obviously the Ethiopian government seeks to contain this sort of, this, this, this surge of inflation, which unfortunately is hitting the, the poorest people the, the hardest. Martin, looking at the World Bank's ease of doing business report 2012, Ethiopia was ranked at 111 out of 183 mm -hmm. countries. Mm -hmm. I suppose what's important here, and this is for 2012, is where has Ethiopia come from? Are we moving forward in terms of the ease to do business or are we going backwards? I think the challenge is, is, is largely uh, twofold. Is, is when one looks at the history of the recent history, economic history of Ethiopia, the, uh, it was said to me recently that the, under the pre under Mengistu sort of regime, the, the, the total wiping out almost of private enterprise in Ethiopia, it made almost the Eastern Bloc look, look pretty capitalist in comparison. So the destruction of, of private economic activity was the first issue. I think secondly, resulting from that, it's, it's, a, it's a far deeper sort of psychological issue in the country. How do, you, how do you rapidly move or try to redirect an economy or society away from a very Marxist um, sort of closed-mindedness, state-heavy, bureaucratic approach to, to, to doing things to one which is seeking to, to boost in you know, entrepreneurship, um, high growth, and, and, and as, as John alluded to, is marketizing the economy. So I think Ethiopia is becoming extremely low-based. The most important thing, the most striking thing for me uh, during the World Economic Forum was we had, um, just a personal anecdote if I may, Bob Geldof was there. And here was Bob Geldof who, who, who back in the 80s exposed the, 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 uh, the, the atrocious um, conditions or, or uh, impact of conflict in terms of the, the famine and the starvation, which all of us in our formative years remember Ethiopia for. Twenty-odd years later, Bob Geldof is in Ethiopia at World Economic Forum 
talking about his private equity fund wanting to invest in Ethiopia. And I think Ethiopia is perhaps the macro challenge, uh, into external challenge, at least, to start to uh, really do you have a country of such a very, very brand, bad brand. And I think how, to, how does it reposition its brand away from starvation and famine, which many of us remember Ethiopia for, rather towards a high growth frontier economy in Africa. But it is changing those perceptions. And ignore Ethiopia at your peril, would you say, John? Absolutely. Look, with a population of 84 million people um, and a country that, you know, you know what was interesting is building up to the World Economic Forum, everyone was talking about how we're going to be out of Blackberry, out of Fort Rich, you know, out of all that good stuff. Yet everything worked when we were there, which tells you the country is changing. The country is not just opening to the international, to China and India. It's actually opening to the rest of Africa. I thought that was phenomenal. It's mm -hmm. absolutely opening. Thank you so much for your time. Much appreciated. John Kuchura is the head of corporate banking Barclays Africa. We're going to a quick commercial break now. When we return, we'll be zoning in on the privatization of state-owned enterprises in Ethiopia. Martin Davis stays with us.